Yeah, uh, thank you, Barbara. Hello and welcome to Encounters, New Perspectives on Asia, America and Europe. My name is Will Ferner. I am the director of the HCA, the Heidelberg Center for American Studies at Heidelberg University. With my colleague Barbara Mittler, founding director of CATS, the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies, I would like to briefly introduce this new series of dialogues jointly initiated by our two institutes. Before we will do so, I would like to share with you that yesterday Heidelberg University was struck by a terrible incident. A shooting at the med school left two of our students dead and several uh, wounded. The entire university is shocked and grieves for the victims of this act. Our hearts go out to them and their families and to the students and colleagues who witnessed these terrible events. We cannot yet grasp what has happened, but as an academic community, we stand together in these difficult hours. It is difficult to go back to business as usually after what has happened. Please permit me to ask you for a moment of silence before we proceed. Let us now please proceed uh, with the introduction of our encounters series. The events in this series focus on the relationship between the two superpowers of the 21st century, the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. With a stunning rise of the People's Republic in recent decades, this relationship has become increasingly contentious. China's growing self-confidence is a challenge for the US and its allies alike, and thus also embroils Europe in this new trans-Pacific geopolitical rivalry. While Europe's security continues to be guaranteed by the United States, its economic ties to China have grown considerably over the last decades. As a result, the European Union and its individual member states are looking for a safe haven somewhere in the simmering conflict. It is our conviction, therefore, that we need to know more about these two nations that will shape the world of the 21st century. Our series of encounters offers a forum for discussion of multifaceted challenges in which a deeper understanding of Asian and American cultural heritage will play an important role. We hope that these dialogues will thus contribute to an informed debate on one of the most imminent challenges for Germany and Europe. Now, how do we envisage doing this? Our Encounters series brings prominent Chinese and American policymakers, as well as authors, artists, activists, public intellectuals, and representatives from the business community to Heidelberg University. Our guests will engage in a dialogue with scholars from the CADS and the Heidelberg Center for American Studies. We're thus looking forward to a series of nuanced discussions on a wide range of controversial topics that are shaping the exceptional relationship between an established and an emerging superpower. We will zoom in on issues such as the environmental crisis and trade wars, questions of technology transfer and innovation, white collar crime, and digital surveillance, and last but not least, human rights and freedom of expression. In order to provide multiple perspectives on China-US relations, we will consider different Chinese voices from the mainland, as well as from Taiwan and Hong Kong. We will also offer contrasting American perspectives from politics to the economy and the arts. 
Thus, we will analyze newly emerging political and geostrategic constellations in a multipolar world with two strong rivals and discuss their consequences for Germany and Europe. How do the European Union and its member states position themselves in the competition between China and the United States? What are their current positions and strategies? What will the future bring to this new global landscape? Our encounters will seek answers to these questions. And we thank you already now for joining us in what we hope to be a series of inspiring exchanges. Now, before we begin, just a few technical matters. We would ask you to always keep your microphone muted um, unless later in the question and answer section you want to speak up um, when we call on you. Um, and, uh, but we, are wel we welcome you to open the videos if your bandwidth um, allows this. Um, and uh, if there is any trouble um, with the connections or any such thing there is a technical support um, in the chat um, that you can call um, uh, Herr Kramer will be at your service uh, whenever something goes wrong um, with regard to the zoom meeting that is and now without further ado um, Welf will introduce our two speakers of today Thank you, uh, Barbara. Yes, I would like to welcome you once again now to the second event of Encounters, which is entitled Visions of a New Global Order, A View from China. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the participants of today's event. Wang He is professor in the Department of Chinese Language and Literature at one of China's elite universities Tsinghua University in Beijing. His research focuses on Chinese literature and intellectual history. Between 1996 and 2007, he was executive editor of the influential magazine Dushu, founded as a monthly in 1979 during the democracy movement with a famous loan, No Forbidden Zone in Reading. It was under Wang Hui and Huang Ping that Du Xu emerged as a socially critical journal, uncongenial to some, but nevertheless posing questions that undoubtedly resonated widely. Wang Hui has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Edinburgh, Bologna, Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley, Göttingen, and Heidelberg, and many other universities. In 2008, the US magazine Foreign Policy named him as one of the 100 most influential public intellectuals in the world. His books include The End of Revolution, China and the Limits of Modernity, published with Verso in 2010, China's New Order, Society, Politics and Economy in Transition, published in 2003 with Harvard University Press, and The Politics of Imagining Asia, published in 2011, also with Harvard University Press. Joining Wang Hei this afternoon is Marina Rudiak, an assistant professor at the Institute of Chinese Studies at Heidelberg University. Her research focuses on China's international development cooperation, global China, and coded communication in China's public diplomacy. Her doctoral dissertation, Becoming a Donor, National Role Conceptions, Reform Dynamics and Learning and China's Foreign Aid System, traces the evolution of China's foreign aid since the early days of the People's Republic. Marina Rudiak is the co-author of the Decoding China Dictionary and the author of the China Aid Blog. Previously, she was a development professional for the German Agency for International Cooperation in Beijing. She's also a member of the Global Diplomacy Lab and the BMW Foundation Responsible Leaders Network. Maria Rudiak serves as policy advisor for governmental and non-governmental organizations on issues related to Chinese aid, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and China in Africa. I'm now looking forward to the conversation on 
visions of a new global order, please be kindly advised uh, to keep your mics turned off and to use the chat for your questions. Marina Rudiak and Wang Che, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Werner. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Werner, for your introduction. Just to make sure, um, can you hear me well? Yes, the important question in the virtual space. So um, it's a pleasure for me to, um, to guide um, through the dialogue with Professor Wang Hoi to engage in a dialogue with him. And I um, would just like to note briefly that it's not only this time a dialogue with China or a global dialogue, it's also a dialogue across generations of scholars because I am of a younger generation. And I just would like to express how um, envious some colleagues of my were that I have the opportunity to engage um, in a dialogue with Professor Wang Hui, who also for China scholars of my generation is a very admired Chinese public intellectual. Um, as um, Professor Werner said in the introduction, we need to know more about China and the US in Europe at this point in time. But we also have to acknowledge where we stand. And that is that if we are honest, while we need to know probably equally much about both, we do know much more about the US than we do know about China. And um, we are facing a huge asymmetry of knowledge because in fact, China knows us as Europe much better than we do know China and probably China knows the US much better than the US knows China. Um, one barrier is probably the language because if we want to understand US politics, we can go and just read the New York Times or, or watch the news. Um, it's difficult to do the same when it comes to China because as we all know, only few of us are literate in Chinese while maybe 5% of everything that is published openly in China is translated. Um, another issue maybe is that for a long time in, in the West, there was the assumption that as China develops, as China follows up the path of um, reform and opening, it will become more like us, the West. Um, and um, at some point, at latest, um, since the onset of the era of Xi Jinping, um, and a dis disillusionment set in that obviously China has not become more like us. And um, the New York Times ran a very interesting headline saying China failed to fail. Because for a very long time, everybody was waiting that China's authoritarian model will fail, and it didn't. Instead, we are facing a G2 world with not only shifting um, power structures, but also with China proposing um, uh, another or alternative vision of how international relations should happen. Um, and this vision can be um, equated to a term that um, has been raised very often both by Chinese officials, by Chinese intellectuals, um, also by President Xi Jinping himself, namely that the world needs a community of shared future for mankind. Um, this is a term that has been promulgated as a new concept of global governance and as an alternative to what um, many Chinese actors have described as the old or Western dominated type of international relations, which they consider to echo a Cold War mentality and a confrontational zero sum game. In Europe and the United States, the term has received a mixed reception. Some have interpreted it, it as, as China's commitment to multilateralism. Um, for example, Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, very much praised Xi Jinping um, for reminding that we are all part of a community of shared future and for his commitment to multilateralism, especially during the tenure of Donald Trump, 
when um, the United States retreated from um, the global arena. Um, others see the promulgation of the term, especially in United Nations organizations, as an attempt to undermine the liberal international order. And in fact, again, the United States have made a lot of efforts not to have the term community of shared future for mankind included in official documents, arguing that the shared future, in fact, means um, that um, there should be no universal values, but rather something like the least common denominator. One thing that can be said definitely is that neither in Europe nor in the United States, there is a clear understanding of what the term community of shared future for mankind actually means. And the question is, is there a clear definition or is there a debate within China between Chinese intellectuals and also between the intellectuals in the state of what this exactly is, how it should look like, and which historical legacies and thought traditions are shaping it. So with that, I would like to hand over the world to Professor Wang Hui to give us uh, a Chinese view, maybe his Chinese view, or tapping in into the debates in China of what is it about the community of shared future for mankind? And how does the state of the world look at the moment from a Chinese perspective? Professor Wang Hui, um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. And also thanks Professor, uh, uh, Professor Warner and uh, Professor Mittler. It's really nice for me. Uh, to revisit in the screen, of course, to Heidelberg. So that exactly 19 years ago, I think, in the 2003, in the spring, uh, during the period of the SARS, I visit Heidelberg, spend the one semester there, where I really enjoy to stay there. So it's another time I really hope that I can visit in person the Heidelberg, first of all. It's sad to hear the news about the shooting. It's really happened in such a beautiful city. It's really sad. Um, as you may know that I was, I'm not uh, a specialist for the geopolitics or international relations and so on and so forth. I'm mainly the intellectual historian and the literary historian too. So, but I try my best to think about this issue. And uh, when I, it's just to remind Maria's comments, I remind, remind me of uh, one thing that last year, the Falling War Forum in Germany, actually every year they, they have publicized some 10 top, top 10, the, the scientists, the social scientist achievements. The top one given was given to the Margaret Levy's work, which actually focus on the issue, uh, in, namely the expanded community of fate. I serve as a juror. When we discuss about it, I, 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 I told them there was a, almost the same the slogan or the, the idea that from China to talk about the, the community for uh, the shared future, uh, the shared future for the humankind. That means go beyond the old boundary of the nation state and try to expand it, a kind of global community, the new idea for thinking politically at that time. I think it's uh, uh, the interesting, everybody, I think at that time, at least, among the jurors, nobody knows about it. But now I guess more and more people knows about it. So here I try to give a, a, a short statement about, uh, uh, to talk about my understanding and the contemporary issues. And then we can discuss about in details on these issues. Now it's now we are living in 
in the era of so-called uh, the, the COVID-19, the era of COVID-19. Uh, there was an art exhibition in Beijing last year, which entitled 2020 plus, means that there were some completely different conditions for the development of after the 2020, after the birth of the COVID-19. So at that time, when someone asked me, what is the uniqueness of this year's uh, epidemic? I think there were three characteristics. The first is its a scale and the speed. And it started from one place to quickly spread to all other places with global involvement. The length of time and the greatest of the spread are unprecedented. Without the conditions of the globalization, the epidemic will not happen at such a speed and a scale. So it is impossible to discuss the epidemic without thinking about the contradictions contained in the globalization process. I think that the issue, the backgrounds for us, we talk about the, the community of shared future for the humankind became more urgent to them before. Secondly, the epidemic crisis is not a single crisis, not a simple public health crisis, but also a chain of series of crises. The pandemic has accelerated the other existing crises and triggered new ones. So it is also a crisis of, crisis of geopolitics, economic and a social political crisis. It's every, all, almost everything, every side touched by this current crisis. All kinds of the social crises are involved at the same time and entertained in the pandemic. So these are the chain of crisis, the second, I think. Third, I think, th these chains, crises, highlight a contradiction. That is the contradiction between the first level is the old concept, the older language, and the new conditions. So we, we use our familiar terms and the language that describe the conditions, but it's unlimited. And that's why on the one hand, we talk about the, the so-called the community of shared future for, for humankind. Sounds a little bit abstract, but on the other hand, it's really new because we really need some new language for describe the condition. Then we can imagine what kind of the future for us. So in today's pandemic, the situation, the spread of the virus, virus leads to the social distance in the process of the pan pandemic prevention. However, to maintain this social distance, it is necessary to implement isolation and rely on collective recognition on a large scale. We need a community, a unit, an organization, and a country to protect it. That is to say the epidemic has redefined the community and the communities. But the language used to express these relationships are, is basically in an older pattern. In fact, this is not only the older language, but also the older language in the older relationship. For example, the crisis is global, but the protection mainly occurs within the framework of nation state. We clearly know that it is impossible for a single country to be immune. But in fact, globally, the prevention of pandemic situation is still the country or the, the nation state centered. How to describe the crisis in a new language is an imaginative problem. Recently, there are many friends actually in Europe and in some other places, put forward a vaccine internationalism. I think these are vaccine internationalism reflect the needs for such the new conditions, I think. So it is necessary to rethink the internationalism, not the 20th century type, not the 19th century type maybe, but it's a new type for the new conditions. At present, China exports and it donates the vaccine on a large scale, which exceeds the sum of all other countries. 
In the Tango crisis, such vaccine ignite nationalism was quickly interpreted by other forces as geopolitics, geopolitics, competition, and a strong force. It's also defined by some people here too. How to describe such a behavior? We need a new language to describe such behavior patterns, which eventually oriented to new, give us some new orientation for our new behavior in such conditions, I think. Since the end of the Cold War, there have been two most prominent the themes. One is the end of history, of course, that's very famous. The other is even more famous, is the clash of civilizations, one after another. However, if we, if we observe on the today's conflict conditions, the defects and the weakness of these two descriptions are completely exposed. As far as the Asian region is concerned, actually since the 19th century, Northeast Asia has been undergoing drastic changes continuously. These change is actually a part of the continuous change since the Europe-centered era of so-called the, the, the maritime era, and actually the, from the 16th century, of course. The whole conflict in this area contains two main features afterwards, especially in the 19th century. The first feature is that from the 19th century or even earlier, the competition among big powers in this region is continuous phenomena. In the early days, there were conflicts between Britain and Russia and Japan and Russia. Then there were conflicts between Japan and the United States competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. And then there were, after the collapse of the Soviet Union was the rise of China, all of which were con constantly changing. Of course, the player were changing, but basically it's still in this region, the big power competition was a long phenomenon. It's not new. On the one hand, we have the new condition, but on the other hand, these phenomena that were, why we in the, such a condition, our imagination even sometimes actually throw us back to the old pattern of thinking. It's partly because that phenomenon was continuous phenomena for long term. Therefore, in a sense of geopolitics, we can regard this geopolitical crisis as a continuation of the conflicts between the major powers that have spread to this day and have not been completely finished. The new phenomena is that with the change in the 19th century, especially I think is mainly the 20th century. The industrialization conditions in Northeast Asia, which are rare in other non-Western regions have become more and more important in the global economy and the politics. Today, the second largest economy and the third largest economy, as well as the 12th largest economy are all gathered in this area. So if we add up the GDP of China, Japan, and South Korea, it's already accounts for a considerable part of the global economy, which higher than the EU and almost equal to the US, I think. This is an unprecedented phenomenon, which contains the possibilities of change of the old monopoly structure. Because we talk about the old monopoly structure means that the monopoly of technology, the monopoly of financial markets, the monopoly of the natural resources, the monopoly of massive destruction weapons, and the monopoly of mass media. And all these were some new possibilities to transform these kind of global structures. However, globally speaking, we have no such a framework, a new political framework to surpass the old nation state and the political social organization, the new forms. We have no such new forms. And also now it's still difficult, still. I mean, in the globally speaking, it's, it's no global governance that is adapted to the change, especially the rise of Asia and some old peripheral areas, the political economic relations. So I, I think that from the perspective of geopolitics, this 
is a major change in the past the century, even longer, maybe the five to 500 century or the 100 century, uh, 500 years or the 100 years, that a different perspective to see the shift of the geopolitical center of gravity, uh, gravity is taking place. But without the new framework, it's created uncertainty now. So a lot of the geopolitical crisis happened in these, I think that the, 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 the broad context this is the first question we need to discuss and think about, I think. Simply speaking, it is better to understand the so-called clash, so clash of civilization is a longer historical process because the so-called civilization of the civilization, the clash of civilization in these themes itself is a concept produced in the historical process of the colonialism, imperialism, racism in the 19th century. We can describe the so-called clash of civilizations in this long history of the colonialism and the capitalism. The second feature of this area is the juxtaposition of the multiple heritages. That's the, uh, that, that is to say the colonial heritage has spread to this day and still affects this area. The Cold War and the post-Cold War, none of these legacies is com completely ended. The colonial legacy, the legacy of the Cold War, and the legacy of post-Cold War have all changed in these places. The conditions for forming new identity politics still exist here. We can see that some conflicts related to the early colonial time or the Cold War time, even the post-Cold War time. So this is an overlapping process. This is an area with multiple contradictions and multiple historical relations. Globally, the conclusion of the end of the history, so-called, assumes the contradiction between the past social systems, mainly the end of the contradiction between the so-called capitalism and the socialism, that the typical dichotomy of the Cold War period. But we can see that all kinds of the new social conflicts are being repackaged with the old ideology. And it seems that the more hegemonic countries dominated by the United States, the more emphasis now they put on the ideology. In this sense, the discussion of the so-called end of ideology seems to have ended too. Among the juxtapositions crisis I mentioned here, the one of the most striking features in Asia is the juxtaposition of the Cold War and the post-Cold War. The juxtaposition of the two has the most direct influence on this area. The contemporary world order was formed by the end of the socialist system and the end of the Cold War. We often talk about the end of the Cold War, but in fact, in East Asia, actually globally speaking too, the Cold War never ended, especially in, in Asia. This, we can see that the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Strait, and all these kind of the, and the Sino-Japanese relations were still deeply influenced by that legacy of Cold War. The so-called end of the Cold War was actually not caused by the reconciliation between the two sides, but ended with the failure of one side. So that, to some extent, China was exceptional because after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, China was still here. And China started the market reform much earlier. As a result, the victor, but in any case, the, as a result, the victorious party play, completely ignored the crisis hidden in its own social system that define the atmosphere of the post-Cold War period. From this, we can see that the contemporary world situation is a crisis of dual political systems. The first is a crisis of political system <clears throat> marked by the collapse of the socialist state system. That is the socialist system in Eastern European Europe represented by Soviet Union. Still, that framework is still exist in its different ways, alternatively, in China, Vietnam, and some other countries. 
But with the end of the Cold War crisis, the end of the world system, we can see another system that is a crisis. We call it a crisis of democracy that people are discussing today. That is a system on the winning side in the Cold War itself is in crisis. The reason behind the phenomenon often described as, a, for example, the populism and so on, is the second crisis. And actually, that is the democratic crisis. In this sense, the old language can hardly describe the nature of political crisis because you can talk about the crisis in China or others and by blaming it as a non-democratic, but how to relate it to the so-called democratic societies. They shared some, a lot of the crisis. So these set of the expositions represented by the conclusion of history, democratic and non-democratic ones can be said to be uh, inflationary language, sometimes overused and it became no substantive connotation today. The real crisis that different political systems here and there, I think, are facing today, politically, I used 10 years ago, I actually, I gave a talk at the SP day that uh, at that time the, uh, in Germany, in Berlin, I called a decline of the representation. What is the, I just summarize and not want to repeat what I talked 10 years ago, but basically that is the basic form of the political system is out of touch with its social form globally and domestically. We look at the wave of first crisis, the end of the socialist system in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. It is the disconnection between its basic political value and social form. People can't be the real masters of society, which constitutes a contradiction with legitimacy of socialism, because if you read the constitution and the charters of the party, they always claim that the, 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 the rulers were the working class and so on and so forth here and there, so we in China too. Today, the crisis, and, but it's the, the, the complex. Today, the crisis of democracy is also the disconnection between the political form and the social form. Because these form of political democracy and a voting system can't solve the problems of high inequality and division at the social level. And the problem that party politics can't represent the opinion of different social groups and so on. People want to express it directly beyond the framework of the party politics. And the resulting chaotic situation is often described as a populism because it's still the case. We ha have no such a frame, new framework to fit, in, to fit the new conditions. So the populism is fundamentally the product of the, these crises, not the other way around. So it is impossible to grasp grasp and overcome these political crises if we only describe the condemn this populism from the surface instead of analyzing the representative fracture behind it, it's difficult. So that I think it's uh, 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 the, my basic uh, the, the, uh, kind of uh, the, the judgments for the political crisis. So in short, we can see that the global ecological problems, the contradictions a bit between the developing countries and the developed countries, the developed countries unwillingness to take responsibility and the burden of developing countries development they want to, don't, don't want to stop it, its development are all problems brought about by the global division of labor. But now there was no global solution framework and no global agreement can be reached up to now, though there was efforts continuously. This is an important contradiction in content today. When we still describe these new contradictions and new crises in the older language, democratic or the non-democratic language, market and non-market economies, we were actually missed the real cross of the crisis because the methods provided by these older language can't solve the representative fracture. 
and can't respond to the social economic conditions behind the fracture. The repetition of the old language will only temporarily form some kind of the social mobilization domestically, globally, and so on and so forth. But it's actually in effective in solving problems. We really need a new thinking. The new thinking needs to synthesize all kinds of the heritage in history and summarize them and theorize them, maybe. The first thing I think to think about it is our region, for example, the long history of Asia. What are the conditions for different cultures, religions, and communities to coexist? Because Asia option now is still so diverse. Can the political, geopolitical, geographical, and the cultural conditions be innovative in the contemporary era? Instead of simply going back to the old methods, we should extract the valuable elements from the older methods. It's not when we talk about history, not necessarily mean that we want to go back to the history, try to find some helpful elements for rethinking. After summing up our developing uh, and developing, we can surpass this kind of structure in the contemporary world, which is the conflict between the so-called nationality and the nationality. This is the first question that we need to think about. Actually, that we really need to surpass the 19th century and early 20th century legacy to rethink the history, to rethink about the order domestically and regionally and globally. The second problem is that is the relationship between the social equality and the diversity. The inequality we are facing today is manifested in regional aspects and the social strata as well as among countries. Instead of going back to the old concept of equality, we should further consider the relationship between the equality and the diversity. In Asia, for example, or even within the Eastern Asia, there were institutional diversity, social systems are so different, cultural diversity, social diversity, and so on and so forth. Under these diverse conditions, we should explore the conditions that can coexist and be peaceful. Because today, peace is a truly global issue. How to avoid the outbreak of large scale conflicts and wars and seek the road of peace needs to be discussed again now. In this sense, although the forms of some struggles against the hegemony in the 20th century have changed, the process of the hegemony or the dehegemony should not end because the structure of the hegemony is the origin of today's social conflicts. And but in this transformation process itself, some, there was a lot of the uncertainty and a new crisis could emerge here and could be even dangerous. We must understand this instead of maintaining this hegemony, but in any case, so that the whole regional relations tend to be balanced and equal and the order of multipolar world can take shape. This is a second point. Third, I think the large scale social projects such as so-called poverty alleviation, the rural revitalizing projects in China, in a certain sense, the, the, uh, we don't still not sure it's only the beginning. The success or the failure determines whether Chinese society can enter a new and a fairer historical period. These should not be confined to one country or one region, but to explore the different institutional forms to solve the poverty in the world, so unequal now. To reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, thereby reducing the social conflicts. Politically, it is necessary to develop the new political forms so that the ordinary people can also obtain the possibility of self-expression. Otherwise, it is difficult to avoid the rise and the conflict of so-called the populism. Finally, finally, in the past, we often discussed the phenomena of regional integration in Asia and Europe after the end of Cold War, or the efforts of regional integration beyond or based on the nation states which can be said to have achieved partial success. But today, this process 
whether in Europe or Asia, it's in the new crisis. In Europe, for example, the BRICS is a sign in Asia whether it can be called the new Cold War. Can, whether we still can use talk about the new Cold War or not. But however, with the adjustment of the Sino-Japanese relations and the implementations of American policy of returning to Asia, the region has once again fallen into the crisis of regional contradiction. This regional contradiction is not only the confined to the region. Actually, we can see the military alliance, different kinds of, like the United States, Britain, and Australia is a new military alliance. The five so-called Five I Alliance, the East World Expansion NATO, and the great influence of all these powers structures on the reconstruction of relations in this region. In this sense, on the one hand, we need to re-explore the new ways of regional integration because there have been or are still relatively successful cases. It's some like Asian and some other. Uh, the, on the other hand, the Belt Road Initiative, though is still the, a lot of the debates itself, whether or not they can be uh, create a new model. It's uh, still, uh, it depends on the, the practice. It is not the integrate, but, but, but basically these kind of the new project, the initiative, what made it different from old pattern of the regional integration? It is not integrated in a single region, but also cross region, cross region. So in today's transportation and other te technical conditions, such a model should become, it's not, I mean, talk about model means just trans-regional and a different, not only based on the geopolitical relations. And so a kind of the model of thinking about the new space, became possible and necessary. So we need to think about the space in different way from the older geopolitical relations. Its purpose is to enhance the people's communication, increase the interconnection and form a new and a peaceful global order. So of course, at this moment, uh, I can't see the sudden change. Uh, partly, we can't see whether, for example, this year will be the beginning of the sudden change too. Partly because the old contradictions are not formed in one day. Even if the pandemic will ease, it will not return to the old so-called normal state in the past. The superposition of the new contradictions creates the new conditions. Today, I think the peace has become an important issue in this region and in the global scale, which needs the common attention and exploration of the whole world, of course, for China and Asia too. So that's why I think the issue of the community of shared future for the humankind or the expanded community of fate is a necessary issue we need to exploit further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wang Hui, for giving us this very broad and very rich introduction. Um, I've noted down um, a number of points um, I would like to pick up um, and um, maybe I will just go step by step and start with um, something you um, mentioned um, in the very beginning. Um, and this is both the role of language and of history. Um, first of all, what, um, what you said and what resonated with me very much is that um, we are now at a point um, in time where the world globally is facing unprecedented challenges. And yet we are trying to solve, it looks, um, the problems of the 21st century with the approaches, the thought patterns, the language of the 20th century, or 
or even earlier. And um, one thing that tends to be ignored very much, at least in, uh, in the Western, or and in particular in the transatlantic context, maybe even in the United States more than in Europe, is the role of historical memory. Um, and um, one thing that is maybe not aware to, to those in the audience who um, do not come from a Chinese studies background is that in Chinese, there is de facto no past tense. So I am and I was is more or less the same. Um, there is a, a story somebody told me um, that when her father passed away, in English, she needed to switch from my father is to my father was, while in Chinese, it was still wobaba shi, um, meaning that just emotionally, when she was speaking Chinese, her father was much closer to her than in English. And this is, um, you know, this small example is just to explain that the historical memory in history is much, much more present in Chinese and in China than it is in the West, um, because it always is. Um, nevertheless, I mean, uh, there is enough talk about um, that in Europe, we kind of just managed to, to digest the consequences of the World War II so that we can start digesting the consequences of World War I. Um, but when um, we talk um, about dealing with China, one thing that can be observed, especially in the US context, that there is not very much awareness for, for historical memory. Um, not even going far behind, but I've heard like recently at a high profile event, somebody saying, well, Afghanistan, it's gone. You know, we're over it, we're moving on. Although, you know, this is quite a recent thing. So um, my first point would be um, to ask, to you, Professor Wang, who, what is the relevance of historical memory? And um, is it something that we need to bring much, much more to the table, in particular in light of the fact, and this is something I observe in my own research, that the debates that are taking place now are very much parallel to the debates that were taking place in the 1950s, just immediately after the Second World War. The language, the wording, the conflicts we observed back then between the United States and China are not at all unsimilar to what we observe today. While the challenges are completely different and global talking about the pandemics and climate change. So how do we, you know, what is your point on, on the historical memory and how can we manage to bring it into awareness especially considering that in the West, our, we don't have the language for that and our governments change so quickly that there is no institutional memory. So I, I answer the, the, now, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, a lot of people talk about these issues about the rule of the history in China and uh, I remember that uh, long ago when I, the first time when I visit America, the people told me that the history means that, that something happened 20 years ago, but how can you talk about the 5,000 years ago <laughs> or the 2,000 years ago or the something? But partly because I think that the uh, historical memories in, in Europe was somehow something she was very deep. And for example, the Holocaust, so much discussions about the Holocaust. In, 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 if you read the whole historiography in all the comments and read back to that, and even now the, the, in the geopolitics, a lot of the rhetoric came from that period uh, now. So it's, it's not necessary to say that the, the, the China was specific, have the, the special, the memory for the history. But on the other hand, I think that in this region, yes, the, the role of history is played a big, it's, I, I don't want to say, uh, the, before that, some observers, uh, sinologists, old, very traditional sinologists, while trying to treat the history, uh, 
in China as the rule of the religion in the West. So they always appear to the God or the religion. But China was somehow, they always talk about the history. To some extent, not completely right, but to some extent, I think it's an interesting observation in any case. But what I can say that the problem is that there's so many elements of history were still as a living reality in our conditions. So that's, I think, very important. Not necessarily mean that people want to go back to the early stage, but these phenomena, in order to explain this reality, you had to go back to the early stages, different stages. So that's I, I, the, the first. Second, just, just like the case you mentioned, um, for example, the, the, the retreat of American troops from Afghanistan. They simply became Afghanistan, gradually became the forgotten corner in somewhere uh, far away from some, some places and uh, nothing to do with their own history in, in any case. That was the pattern of the maritime era. You know, the early, this why I said that the 16th century as a new starting point, that because the beginning of the, uh, the maritime era, some powers by the technology, new technology, went to some place, no any connection with their own society. So they go there, the settlers or something, only through the settlers, they created the connection with their own home countries. But in Chinese case, all these re regional relations was mixed, invaded in our daily lives. So if you talk about this issue, Tibet issue or any other Western regions issues, it always goes back to the early histories. So in that sense, it's different. I think that's why the historical memory is shaped by history itself. So sometimes it's the only, you can say some people were specifically have the long memory or short memory, but that pattern itself was also shaped by different historic conditions. It's become the historical unconsciousness, maybe. So that's my, maybe the observation here. Um, you're absolutely right to, to say that in Europe, historical memory very much plays a role. And I think there is a case just unfolding at, at this moment where, um, where it comes into play. And this is the question whether Germany should sell um, weapons to Ukraine um, so that Ukraine can defend itself against Russia. And, and, and this is something that is, you know, has created a lot of international debates um, about Germany's role internationally, in part damaging German reputation. But what is um, mostly not mentioned that the reason why Germany is not selling weapons to Ukraine has a lot to do with, with the sense of historical debt vis-a-vis -vis Russia because of World War II. Um, and uh, and um, the impression that I get from talking to, to colleagues in the US at the moment is that um, in the administration in particular, um, because there are not, that, not as many regional specialists in the administration that there used to be in the past, there is just no sense for, for the sensitivities anymore in the same way. Um, one other um, question I wanted to pick up um, is um, the role of the Belt and Road Initiative, which at least in the communication of the Chinese um, government um, is um, described um, as synonymous with the community of shared future of mankind. And the Xi Jinping um, has been saying that the Belt and Road, the Road Initiative is um, you know, the manifestation of China's commitment to multilateralism, a manifestation of the vision of a shared future for mankind, and an alternative way of multilateralism that is not based on alliances, but on joint consultations. Um, now, alliances are, are a term that is um, very close um, 
to, uh, to the transatlantic discourse. And what we have seen more recently is the United States going to, to East Asia, to the Asia Pacific with a proposal of establishing an ally alliances. And we have observed a lot of um, you know, reserved stance from, from the ASEAN and from the East Asian countries, um, not because of the United States per se, but because of the term alliance. Because in the understanding of East Asian countries, alliance means that you go to war together. And this is a commitment East Asian countries are not willing to give in the most part. So obviously there is not enough understanding of, again, in terms of language, what the specific term means in, in the East Asian context. And at the same time, um, the Belt and Road Initiative is portrayed as a problem for, for the West. And we have seen um, initiatives coming out from the transatlantic context, um, being in the G7 Build Back Better World, or um, the Blue Dot Initiative of the United States, or the very new European Initiative Global Gateway, which propose alternative infrastructure initiatives, but end up looking more about solving the Western China problem instead of solving the development challenges of the countries. Um, and a big underestimation is what, what um, is how the BRI perceived, for example, in Africa. And there is a very interesting interview by um, Judy Moore, who is former Minister of Public Works of Liberia, who said that even if the BRI is going to fail completely, it is still a success because for the first time, somebody came up with a plan to connect the poorest countries of the world with the richest countries of the world. And even if it fails, the idea by itself is innovative. And one could ask the question, why, why was there no European infrastructure plan, given that Europe is an African neighbor? Why has there been no equivalent American plan, given that Africa is an upcoming and very important actor. And, and in the end, the world consists of more than just Europe, United States, and China. But the, the, while China obviously has to offer important global public goods, it still stays an authoritarian country. And it appears that for the West, this contradiction that you can be authoritarian and internationalist is extremely difficult to resolve and cannot be resolved as long as one stays in the thought patterns of the 20th century. Um, so I was wondering what your um, thoughts would be on that. Um, uh, thank you for, I'm not a specialist on, on this, uh, the, the One Belt Road Initiative issue. Um, but I, I think it's, you are right that, uh, first of all, we also need to go back to the, for the comparison that the infrastructure, that's what I, when I visit Amer African countries, I talk to the local people in different regions and a lot of the American countries too. And the basic attitudes there, they, of course, a lot of the crisis, the problems, uh, we have to confess that. But on the other hand, general reaction my impression were positive. They really want to have that because you need to develop its infrastructure. And uh, in, in the 20th century, before the two or 300 years that a colonial time, but so it's so little, the infrastructure developed. So that's the, uh, the, com the, the, the comparison. I think the second issue is that the, uh, the Chinese way of the Belt Road Initiative, especially China, argued that it is not the Chinese project. It is only the initiative. China initiated and wanted to jointly to and different participation from different players. And uh, so this, uh, I think it's uh, important. And also, this is also the strategy, not only in the Belt Road Initiative, but think about the, the regional orders. Partly because, of, of course, for example, in, in Europe or in, in America, many intellectuals and scholars reflect upon 
the nation state and the sovereignty, right? So that's why they go beyond the internationalism or the, the, the cosmopolitanism and uh, criticize that the concept of sovereignty and so on. So the limits there, I, as I said, there's an older language. But on the other hand, in the 20th century, China had a, a long history struggle for the independence. So that's why they know that the sovereignty means a lot to so many third world countries. They don't want to hand over to some other superstructure, the domination and so on and so forth. That's why the basic idea of the interconnectivity or the Belt Road Initiative based on the recognition of that, their independence. I mean, the different countries had their made the last decision, what kind of project that they have to develop is their own decision. So that in that sense is a re re respect for the legacy of national liberation movements in the 20th century. That's a long history and a miserable to some extent. So it's a great but a miserable story. So that's why China know that uh, in that sense, it's, it's also our, uh, the, the, uh, the, the memory too. So in this way, you need to find the interconnectivity based on the recognition of diversity and based on the certain historical achievements for those non-Western countries achieved through the long process of the 20th century, even now. So I think this is a basic idea. So you didn't, you can compare the behavior. China didn't, if any kind of the country, it's, for example, the business, some successful, some the, the failures. Did China did they use the sanction like America to unilaterally sanction for some other countries? Didn't no such behavior and no such institutional base. So you can see these were, were, were uh, uh, so many discussions. So here, uh, for me, I have not. Uh, uh, I, I have, I, I have no, the, as I said, that I'm not the specialist on the very different cases. I know that there's some controversial cases, but basically I had summarized, I did summarize some key concepts that the, uh, for the Belt Road Initiative, I should, uh, I think China also need to develop its philosophy, Belt, Road, Corridors, the Bridge, right? The China or the Asian uh, European bridge that the railway, Sino European railway, and the corridor, Sino Pakistan, Sino India corridors, and the one belt and the one road. All these basic concepts were, I treat these as a concept because it implied the different types of the interconnect, in, interconnectivity, and also in which reflect the recognition of the diversity. So it means that the, it's not the full integration became the one dominated by one power, but still maintain the respect for the diversity here. So I think these are the philosophy. I hope that the Chinese way were more or less, more and follow this logic. But, but of course, we know that uh, this is a global markets issue and a capital issue. This is a, so it's some conflicts and the problems, it's inevitable. So how to rethink of the developmentalism? Uh, it's not only the, in, in, for Chinese case, it's also the case for the Belt Road Initiative too. Yeah, I'm very grateful that you raised this point because um, I'm also not an international relations scholar. I come from Sinology, but my speciality is critical development. And as a critical development scholar, I, I try to, to look at the bigger picture. And, and one final question I would like to ask um, before we move on um, to the Q&A and opening the discussion to our listeners in the virtual space um, is um, while listening to you, um, the question that came up to me is whether democracies actually need an antagonist to be better, because what um, I have been observing and uh, and what is a you know a big debate in in the critical development um, community that at the moment it seems that 
the West um, measures China against what it itself would like to be and not against what it is. Um, so while, you know, if, if uh, using the language of political psychology, it's in a way of dealing, you know, with your own wounds and deflecting them to, to the others. I mean, we have, we have the same pattern in China with the instrumentalization of nationalism vis-a-vis -vis Japan when domestic issues arise and uh, here in both in Europe and, and in the United States in particular during the Trump era, China was used very much to deflect from domestic issues. That being said, it's, there are, you know, in both cases, um, as we all know, enough issues to be addressed. But the question to me is if, you know, Europe and the United States would to become better versions of themselves, um, do they need China to be the antagonist to become that? Or, um, in, basically in a similar way, like the social democracy in Germany, in Western Germany developed because there was the GDR um, and there was kind of the need to come up with a social structure that was in a way compatible. So do, yeah, do democracies need, need the antagonistic China to become better? Uh, I think that the, the first, uh, maybe some, I will answer these questions from different the layers. Uh, the, the first of all, substantively speaking, uh, we need a more democratic society. That's the that's true. I I, I recognize that. However, the uh, the rhetoric of democracy was became so narrow now. Partly because in the post Cold War era, that democracy different type different uh, democracy, right? But in the post Cold War period, that's the, the democracy only means some formal democracy rather than the substantive democracy. So that's the other, I think the big issue. Let's see the social democracy, for example, the social welfare systems that developed in the 20th century without the competition between the two social systems at that time. Like I take the, the Germany as the case, the East and the West the competition, that the improvements of the social welfare system is difficult to imagine. For, for, for both sides. So in that sense, it's not necessarily mean that the, the antithesis or the antagonist, but a certain kind of the social political system, the competition between that from outside give you, you know that the some limits of your social system, you still need to reflect the shortage of your own system that's necessary. Because when we think about our the only one fold without outside, it's dangerous for any society, which means that you lack the perspective to reflect upon your own self. So I, when I was in, I often last year, so many times and when I talk to the European intellectuals, for example, I, my observation, sorry for that, uh, I should say that, I really learned so much from them. They are so reflexive and uh, 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 the critical to their own problems. However, when the topic is switched to China, no difference. It's, it's immediately sucked back to the mainstream media. The arguments are so superficial. Honestly, these are some very critical minds, but still, these are really the trap of thinking. Uh, we need to develop the new idea about the so-called difference. We need to rethink about this, the first. Second, why I said that the, became the formal. Because there are a lot of people here, I think that especially in, in America and in Europe, many scholars, I learned their, from their reflections on these systems. But when they talk about China, there's only the, the, the dichotomy of authoritarian and a democracy. And what you argue for was the, of course, the freedom of expression is absolutely necessary. It's a, it's a need, and also the voting system, right? The, the you need to the, the, the election and the voting and so on and so forth. But then, what's the difference between Russia and China? Russia had the, the, the election system, even Iran and even more, the elect 
electoral, the, the voting right. However, it's also the authoritarian, right? It's uh, from the European perspective, it's also the, uh, the, 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 the authoritarian. But when you talk about China, you talk about these formal systems, you talk to other countries, you have no such standards at all, which means that these term itself is inflation. It's in inflation. It's not necessarily mean that the democracy is not important, but the concept that the term used in rhetoric itself, it's really became more and more empty and sometimes became self assertion or the self-confirmation for the maintaining certain kind of the, uh, uh, the, the sense of the reciprocity. So that's, I think it's uh, the main of the things, uh, the, the wars, because once you stuck there, the people here, we obviously, we are also need that everybody, especially the, 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 when we talk about the social equality we talk about, that the really the everybody should have their rights for the expression. But when you talk about these kind of the issues, we need to think about the, what's the crisis now, the substan substantively. And once you only do this, that in a dichotomical the framework, and then it's, it's missed something. Because basically different associations, as you said, that the, different social systems still has each of them has their weakness and the strengths. You need to mutually learn from each other. And uh, so that's what I think why the, we need a certain kind of reflection on in a conceptual level to think about the issue of democracy. So you can see that what happened, for example, Trump was elected. And then people label him as like a dictator and a strong through force. But in the, dip the dip diplomatic relations, has anything really substantively changed of American attitudes towards Asia or America? I don't see that. So what's, what's the result of, what's the background of that? So we need to think about this. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for a very insightful uh, conversation, uh, Professor Wang Hei, Hei and Marina Rudiak. Uh, we have quite a few uh, questions. Uh, we have been running out of time because of a fascinating uh, exchange, but uh, I think we should uh, take some extra time uh, we have, as I said, quite a few questions. I would like uh, to um, look at the last three questions because they all uh, have a focus on our perception of history uh, that you have been discussing, Professor Wang Rei. And uh, we have uh, one question from uh, Alaina Marangos. Um, and uh, she asked if not all our current discussions have an element of history that only we are not aware of, possibly. Uh, T. Uh, Kampen reminds us that uh, education and also formal education plays a huge role in our perception of history. And maybe there are differences in various countries like the United States or European countries or, or China. And the third question that is uh, concerned uh, with our perception of history is a question from Hans Hasso uh, Kersten. And uh, he uh, says that um, in democracies, the role of elections and media uh, bring uh, the present moment very much into focus necessarily. And he also uh, has another argument and he asks and that is a somewhat provocative question. He asked uh, whether or not uh, Chinese and Russian leaders uh, will be very much living in the present if you want, uh, because they may or might want to cash in, as he says, cash, cash in on the short-term weakness of uh, Western democracies. Uh, so you have three uh, uh, questions uh, about uh, the role of history here. Please go ahead, Professor Wang. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry, I, can you 
hinder that. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, the last question I I I, I remember. Can you repeat the one a little one sentence one and two? I the, the first two. Yeah. The the first question uh, is about uh, the uh, is about our current discussions and whether or not all current discussions always have an underlying element of history uh, that yes, we are yes. just not aware of. Uh, and the second question is uh, about uh, the role of education. There might be different forms of education that focus more or less or in different ways on history in countries like China or the United States yeah. or European countries. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, the first it, it is again about the history. Oh, <laughs> uh, so the history is uh, we live in together with the ghost of, of history, that uh, it's inevitable. Uh, um, I think that the, the first of all, uh, it's, it's, how, it, it's really related to how to understand the history. Sometimes it's a history is unpredictable, right? So it's almost like the future unpredictable. Many historians say that uh, changed a little bit, a, a lot. Obviously, the current situation never happened before. It's, it's a really new condition. But the many things, we can find the elements from the history. That in China, I can say that, I give some examples, some unpresented moment happened to China. The Chinese intelligentsia in the, and, the, and, and the rulers even, they try to imagine this new reality through the lens of history. I given the one example, maybe, in by the end of the 19th century or the beginning of 20th century, especially in the 19th century, that was a very new situation for China. China was forced to sign different treaties and China suddenly realized that China was only one country that among different powers and now and uh, even recognize the weakness that we need to learn from the others to advance ourselves so, so at that time. But you know, that at that time, like the, 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 the intellectuals like uh, Kang Youwei and uh, some others imagine that the global system as the so-called, the period of the warring state re-emerged in the global scale. The warring state was the period of the 2000 years ago. There was a different space competed with each other in a final way. But from this imagination, they gradually grasped the changes and the contemporality of their own. So they developed a new idea for the reforms and so on and so forth. So learn from history, maybe it's certain kind of behavior for many Chinese, I think, try to rethink. But what happened in the 20th century, I would argue that different from before, that the, the history was not only our own history, but other countries' history became our own history, part of the history. For example, if you look at the intellectual debates in China, we had so many discussions for like a German Enlightenment or the Scottish Enlightenment. French Revolution, American Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and so on and so forth, and the Jap Japan, Japanese reform and others, or the third world countries. There are a lot of discussions about other, others' history. Actually, we try to deal with our own reality. So that was, I think, the, the, the phenomenon. Now it's the same that uh, when we think about this issue, for example, the Belt Road initiatives, the, the inspiration came from Silk Road, which was actually the German innovation, the, 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 the German invasion in, in the 1920th century. It was not the traditional uh, term for China, but a kind of the Western theorization of the Chinese Asian practice, but suddenly that became the contemporary the practice. Belt Road Initiative. So these are not necessarily mean that the Belt Road Initiative was the repeat of the Silk Road. It's something from there to 
connected the history and the contemporary practice. I think this is the, the first. The second, I think it's about education. It, it is true, it's very important, the, uh, the, the, the education issue. And uh, I remember that uh, it's about 20 years ago, uh, in some historians from the Balkan countries trying to work together for the kind of the textbook or the historical book was done by the different part. We know that after the wars and the historical memory and also the hatred to each other were there, how to find the way of reconciliation for these. And maybe inspired by this in Asia, in East Asia, there was an effort and the Chinese historian, Japanese historian and the Korean historian, they tried to work together for the common history, the historical textbook. They did, they publicized. However, it was not so in French and also in the process is inevitably so many conflicts and uh, contradictions. So eventually, I don't say this is a failure because a failure for me is a productive concept because every time you, got, you can learn from the failures, but not necessarily means the failure was the end, is the end. Failure means something, conditions was not uh, prepared. We need to create the new conditions for these kind of the, the common historical learning. I think it's very important to now uh, like in East Asia, the Japan, China, South Korea, or other, not, when I talk about the South Korea, it naturally seem, sounds like the excluded the North Korea, but all these countries, Vietnam, Mongolia, well, should be work together for the possible common textbook for the historical learnings. So that's the, uh, the intellectual project. I think it's still necessary for not only for uh, this region, but for, I think the for the everywhere, I think. The third, again, is about democracy or whether or not China has, or the Russia or the leaders and uh, use that the crisis of democracy survive and so on and so forth. Actually, I remember that the, uh, the long ago, it's, uh, I, got, I had the fortune to, to, to talk to the, the former chancellor of Germany, uh, Western Germany, actually the, uh, the uh, Helmut Schmidt. He actually has some insightful comments about these issues, but he said that uh, so many things we are, it's not about the, because even the, the crisis give you the possibilities for this and for that. But whether or not that the change of the, uh, the certain kind of the leadership will change the whole country, I don't think so. Of course, it's a huge influential. But the problem is not maybe the, 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 the Schmidt said that the, the question is that the, at that time is the Crimea crisis is approaching. So he said that we should reflect it, what we did uh, it's the, the, the result of the, the Russian action. To some extent, we also should take some responsibility for this. However, he said that the, I, at that time, he said, I'm the minority among the European leaders. He said that, the, and so on and so forth. But I, I'm, not the, the, uh, I'm not so good in the political science and the international politics. But I think that the, 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 any kind of the question that about these, we need to start it from the, I think the general challenges, because besides no matter no mat what kind of political form and the political systems, the basic challenge are much more same. The uh, ecological crisis, the social inequality, and the whole way of the production, where it's still the, the, and also the traditional relationship, the regional relations, where all these kind of the issues, the common challenges, it's in front of us. So in that sense, we really need to rethink about these kind of the challenges 
And from then to think about the weakness of each political and the social systems. So that find the way for the improve it or the self improve it. So that's, I think it's more productive. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, as I said before, we are running out of time, or I should say we ran out of time a long time ago, but I would say we still want to uh, ask you three more questions about the future. And all these three questions are not only about the future, but about China's role uh, in the future. Uh, there is Barbara Mittler, and I will ask you, uh, the three of you, to ask your questions uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, Barbara Mittler uh, uh, wants to know about the new language that will be spoken in the future in the 21st century. Uh, and with, in connection with China, uh, there is uh, Dr. Agota Reves, uh, who uh, uh, wants to know from you about the community of shared uh, future for mankind and how China uh, will, uh, 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 what the role of China is here. And a third question from uh, Nikola Radinovich uh, about more specifically Chinese soft power in Asia. Uh, maybe Barbara, you want to go ahead uh, with your question and maybe we can collect uh, these three questions uh, for reasons of limited time. Barbara, please go ahead, turn on your mic, please. Yeah, very briefly, um, I, I was cheeky. I asked, uh, do we have a new Xin Zhongguo Wei Lai Di here? And is the language of the future that you talked about in the very beginning, we need a new language, is it going to be Chinese? Next. <laughs> and then we have Dr. Agota Reves. Uh, please go ahead. Um, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm a sinologist coming originally from Hungary, but now based in Berlin. And um, uh, my question is, um, um, so uh, you, you talked a lot about the shared future for mankind. Uh, yeah, shared future for mankind. Um, it's perceived basically not as an international concept, but as a very Chinese concept. So, um, uh, and because it is labeled as Chinese, it actually reinforces all those binaries that you, you were talking about, all those old binaries. So it actually reinforces East-West democracy, autocracy. So uh, do you see any way out? And uh, thank you, thank you. And the third uh, question comes from, uh, Nikola Radionovich, please go ahead. Or should I uh, should I um, explain the question? It's a question about Chinese soft power uh, in Asia, and if China uh, should not use a different language in order to um, improve the soft power in Asia. Okay, uh, it's, it's because it's a very complicated and broad questions. It's, uh, uh, it's difficult to answer in uh, such a short minutes. But thank you, Barbara, for your Xin Zhongguo Wei Lai Ji. It's old, uh, I, actually the, the story, short stories about the feature. Uh, the feature was the feature <laughs> of the uh, 20th century Chinese thinking was deeply influenced by the West, I think, reversed the, the timeline that the, the, because the in Confucian idea was the, the, the golden time was always, it's always past rather than the future. The future was really came from the, uh, the uh, really it's it became the influential in, in, in the 20th century that so many discussions about the future. Now we still, again, whether or not, we talk about the future. So that's the, uh, the big issue. Uh, when we talk about the Xinjiang the, Wei Laiji or the new type of the Xinjiang Wei Laiji, some people will talk about like a science fiction or like a Liu Cixin and some others talk. But I think that uh, still the future was suppressed in the contemporary conditions under our foot. So we need to rethink about the reality 
for search for the alternatives. I think that it's about the principle of hope, of course, that there was a German idea, <laughs> maybe it came from the where is the future? But well, the future is not the in the future, but the in the within the in reality. But a lot of elements of the future surprised by the history and the current power relations. We need to retrieve it through the practice to find it. So that's why we talk about the future is almost when we talk about the history, we talk about the future too. So that's why we already uh, talk so much about this. Second is uh, the, the, the community of shared the future for the humankind and the China. What's the rule of China there? I think that the, when we talk about these, uh, the future were well, different type of, in, in China we had, it's uh, not only the, uh, the uh, only one idea about the shared future in, in China. For, for you know, uh, when the, the Xin Zhongguo Wei Lai Ji and the Liang Qichao's time, it's kind of, we already uh, uh, published, uh, wrote the Da Tong Shu, the great community or the, the, the great harmony in which is no the boundary of the states. However, still some kind of the governance there. This is the one type. It's more or less based on the science and the technology, the latitude, the longitude, and so on and so forth, like a digital time, how that develops. But on the other hand, I think in Chinese version now, we also talk about the recognition of diversity and a certain different cultures. So in the future, means not necessarily means that the all, all the cultures disappeared, only follow the one logic, but still the multitudes or the multiplicity within it was necessary, in which in that multiple society, Chinese culture obviously will have some positions there. As We've lost Wang Hui, um, right? <laughs> huh? Ah, no. Are you coming back, Wang Hui? We're not hearing you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, should we give it another minute or two to see if he's coming back? Yes, otherwise we could start thanking Marina. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I guess uh, I also see that some participants have to leave now and so uh, also in the name of Barbara Mittler, I would like to uh, thank Professor Wang He and Professor Marina Rudiak for this uh, insightful exchange. Our series of encounters will continue on March 31st when we will welcome Reinhard Bütikofer, a member of the European Parliament. Reinhard Bütikofer is foreign affairs spokesman of the Greens in the committee. Um, in the Committee um, on Foreign Affairs and the Chair of the European Parliament's Delegation for Relations with the People's Republic of China. Please join us on March 31st for this conversation. We will post more information on this event on our website soon. And with this, I would like uh, to end this session. <laughs>